Jesus Christ, good evening. Good evening. My name is Andy, I'm one of the pastors here at Central, and it is a blessing and an honor to get to celebrate with you tonight on this Maundy Thursday. Maundy is kind of a strange word. It's not quite Monday, but rather Maundy comes from the Latin word mandatum. And mandatum simply means commandment. This Holy Thursday is the day that we remember that Jesus issued us the new commandment. That we love one another. As Christ has loved us, so are we called to love the world. So this evening we are blessed to be able to hear the word read and proclaimed. To be able to gather around the table and share the breaking of the bread and the passing of the cup. But also in remembering Jesus' very last night with his disciples in the practice of washing of the feet. Rest assured, the feet washing part is simply optional, and we'll talk, talk more about that as we get there. But I want to encourage you, even if you're feeling a little uncomfortable about it, stretch yourself a little and consider having your feet washed. It's a powerful, powerful experience. But for now, I invite you to stand as you are able and join with me in our call to worship, which is on the screen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Christ has prepared the peace of love. Let us join our voices together as one as we sing number 432 in the blue hymnals. Yesu, Yesu, 432.
Let's take a moment and pass the peace of Christ to those who are worshiping here to us. You may be seated. I invite us to pray responsibly the prayer of confession. My sisters and brothers, Christ shows us his love by becoming a humble servant. Let us draw near to God and confess our sin in the truth of God's Spirit. Most merciful God, we, your church, confess that often our spirit does not make that our Christ, where we have failed to love one another as he loves us, where we have left the loyalty to him for the mercy, and then betrayed, deserted, or denied him. Forgive us, we pray, and by your spirit, make us faithful in every time of trial. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. But Christ suffered and died for us, was raised from the dead and ascended on high for us, and continues to intercede for us. Believe the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Let us take a moment of silence as we ponder forgiveness. Amen. Hear the reading of the Gospel. It is taken from the Gospel of John. Before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his time had come to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them fully. Jesus and his disciples were sharing the evening meal. The devil had already provoked Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robes. Picking up a linen towel, he tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a wash basin. And he began to wash the disciples' feet drying them with the towel he was wearing. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you will understand later. No, Peter said, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, Unless I wash you, you won't have a place with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus responded, Those who have bathed need only to have their feet washed, because you are completely clean. You disciples are clean, but not every one of you. He knew who would betray him, and that's why he said it. Not every one of you is clean. After he washed the disciples' feet, he put on his robes and returned to his place at the table. He said to them, Do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you speak correctly because I am. If I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, 
you too must wash each other's feet. I have given you an example just as I have done. You also must do. I assure you, servants aren't greater than their master, nor are those who are sent greater than the one who sent them. Since you know these things, you will be happy if you do them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Pastor DeVern. This past week, have you been watching the news at all? Today was an absolutely fascinating day for news from Iran and the progress and the talks there for nuclear disarmament for the atrocity that happened in Kenya and the shooting of so many Christians. But the story that's been capturing my attention all week is out of the state of Indiana, Riffra. Any of you been following this story at all? Anybody? Okay, I'll, I'll give you, Pastor DeVert has, of course. I'll give you a little bit of background. Riffra, or the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, was signed into law about a week ago in Indiana. And there were those on the Christian right who were praising the courageousness of the governor and the legislature for signing this into law. And then there are those on the Christian left who were furious about it and hurling names and insults. And then those on the Christian right certainly couldn't be undone. They start hurling names and insults back at the Christian left. And in some ways, I thought, boy, this really could be comedic. Except it's not. It's not funny at all. When the overwhelming witness that we as the church continue to provide for the world is acting in unchristlike behavior of name calling back and forth across the aisle. And I think we can all agree that name calling is not very glorifying when it comes to honoring God. But as I watched the drama unfold, I began to wonder what exactly the law was written for and was to help to do. And, and it was touted as protecting Christians' rights to not participate in things that are offensive to our beliefs. The, the long and short is that a small business owner, a Christian photographer, or a, a cake decorator or a Christian dress tailor could refuse their services for a same gendered wedding. Because as we have watched the tide shift and change in our mission, this has become a new reality that we have to learn how to deal with. But then the conversation went further and all these big corporations got involved in the argument and it became clear that the way the law was worded was that any Christian business owner could refuse service to someone that they deemed were outside of their Christian beliefs. It didn't matter if they were gay or lesbian. They could be Buddhist. They could be Muslim. They could be anything. A Christian business owner could simply say, I refuse to serve you because I don't believe what you do. And I remember thinking to myself, what are we Christians, what have we come to in this nation? When the only witness that the unbelieving world sees is us fighting back and forth amongst ourselves with abusive language and overtones, what have we come to when we refuse to serve in the name of Jesus Christ? And all week, as I watched this unfold, I kept hearing tonight's scripture ringing into my head that Pastor DeVern just read. Jesus said to his disciples, just as I have done for you, you also must do. I assure you, Jesus says, servants are not greater than their master, nor are those who are sent greater than the one who sent them. Jesus is saying to them, you all, you're not better than I am. If I can lower myself and serve you all, I expect you to lower yourselves and serve each other and serve the world. Serving one another. That's what Jesus asks us to do. To serve. You know, in all of the gospel stories, 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all the stories contained in there, there's only one instance where Jesus refuses to serve someone. Anyone remember what story that is? There's this Canaanite woman whose daughter was really sick. And she comes to Jesus begging, please heal my daughter. And Jesus not only doesn't serve her, he ignores her. He doesn't even acknowledge that she's alive. And so this woman is tagging along behind the disciples, yelling at them. And the disciples finally say, Jesus, get rid of her. She is annoying the bejeebers out of us. And now this is the place where Jesus finally acknowledges that she exists, that she's alive. And Jesus says, I have come for the children of Israel. It is not right to take the bread from the children and feed it to the dogs. And at this point, the woman throws herself at Jesus' feet, and she says, but even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then Jesus looks at her, and he says, woman, your faith is great. May it be just as you've asked. And the woman's daughter was healed. Now, most of us, when we read this, we think, how in the world could Jesus be so callous to, not, to ignore the woman to begin with, but then to call her a dog, of all things? If Jesus is God, is the God of love, how can he get away with acting this way with her? Unless, unless Jesus wasn't doing this because of her, but rather was doing it because of his disciples. You see, the, the Canaanites, of which this woman was, the Canaanites were dirty, yucky, nasty people to the Israelites. They lived a sinful existence. They worshipped other gods. They were not fit for the kingdom of God. And Jesus, through his language, plays right into the stereotype that the disciples have of who this woman is. His words reflect what is in the disciples' hearts. But so great was this woman's faith, even this Canaanite woman, so great was her love for her daughter that she refused to let any insults and hurtful language stop her. And Jesus rewards her greatly for that love. Love. Today's scripture passage, Jesus says, Today I give you a new commandment. Love one another. Jesus does not say, and the world will know you are my disciples, by your strong stance on your convictions. Jesus does not say, the world will know you by the way that you stand up against what you perceive to be a threat to your faith. Jesus says, the world will know you are my disciples by your love. You know, the Apostle Paul had a couple things to say about the word love. So often we hear this passage read at weddings. But Paul wasn't talking about two human beings getting married when he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He was talking about the wedding of Jesus Christ and his bride, us, the church. Paul was saying, this is what life will be like when believers truly are rooted in Jesus. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not rude. Love doesn't seek its own advantage. Love is not irritable. Love doesn't keep a record or a tally of complaints. Love is not happy with injustice. 
but love is happy with the truth. Paul says, love puts up with all things. That's a good thing for me, right, honey? Love trusts in all things. Love hopes for all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. So let me ask you, how does your life measure up to these standards of love that Paul puts forth? I gotta tell you, I fail at loving others every single day. Ask my wife. Ask my children. Ask my confirmation students. Ask the church staff. How about you? Do you ever fail in showing love the way that it's described in Scripture? Are there people in your life that you choose to refuse to serve? Are there family members that you have that you refuse to forgive? Are there folks that you know that you actively refuse to love? This idea of love and serving others is so critical to Jesus that this is what he chose to use his last living moments teaching. He knew this is it. Do or die. This is my last opportunity with these 12 men because tomorrow I'm not going to be here. And so he expresses this idea of love and service by the best way he knew how to teach it by demonstrating it, by humbling himself, by lowering himself to the lowest of all the household servant roles, the one who washes people's feet after they make the long, dirty trek through the desert. And he even goes so far as to tell Peter that if he refuses to let Jesus serve him in this way, then he can have no part with him. Jesus is willing to give his own life in service. And in return, Jesus asks us to do the same. Jesus showed them. Jesus shows us that if we want to be called followers of him, if we want to glorify God, then first we have to humble ourselves and not be arrogant about our beliefs. But we have to let go of the right to be right. Let me see that again. We have to let go of the right to be right. And instead, let God's Holy Spirit work miracles through our submission and our service to others. So this night, as we remember Jesus lowering himself in service, ask yourself, who is it that God is calling you to serve in your life? Whether they deserve it or not is not the issue. Because remember, we have all received the grace of God, the mercy of God, and we did not deserve it. We received it because God simply loved us. So on account of that same love that Jesus commands us, who is it that God is calling you to reach out in love and service to? Jesus gave us a new commandment, that we love one another. My friends, there is no such thing as a Christian who refuses to serve and then cites Jesus' name as the reason for it. The mark of a Christian is one who is willing to lower themselves, serving all other people at any and all personal cost in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the way of the cross. That's the way of the cross. 
And that's my prayer for each of us. That God's love would fill us, you and me, to the point of overflowing. That that overflowing love of Jesus would come out in our acts of service to others. Do your prayer with me. Holy God, help us. Help us in our brokenness. Help us in our disagreements. Help us as we seek to follow you. Help us to remember that you showed us the way you've asked us to live, humbly bowing down to one another and serving one another in your name. Give us your grace and your strength to seek reconciliation with those people in our lives that we are alienated from. Help to mend the broken relationships in our families by giving us the strength to submit to one another, to serve one another, and to love one another. We ask it in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. I invite you to sing our hymn of preparation, very short, and you probably know this one without the hymnals. Be present at our table, Lord, number 621. together in the living deed of the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for the earth you bring forth bread and create the fruit of the vine. You formed us in your image, delivered us from captivity, and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and gave us grapes as evidence of the promised land. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, when we turned aside from your way and abused your gifts, you gave us to him your crowning gift, emptying himself that our joy might be full. He fed the hungry, healed the sick, ate with the scorned and forgotten, washed his disciples' feet, and gave a holy meal as a pledge of his abiding presence. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And then, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And he gave thanks for it. And then he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after he had 
taken the bread. And after the supper, he took the cup. And he gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples. And he said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them to be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may for the world be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. like to invite our communion stewards to come forward and be served, and I'll give us a few words of instruction. We'll be serving by intention this evening. That is, the communion stewards will tear off a piece of bread and hand that to you. Don't eat that quite yet. Hang on to it. And then you can dip just the corner of that into the juice. Being careful not to touch your fingers to the juice, just barely touching the bread and letting it wake up. And then you can receive that right away. If you wish to be in prayer, the communion rail is up and you are welcome to kneel and then return by the side aisles. However, this evening, rather than going back into your pew, if you wish to participate in the foot washing, we invite you to go all the way to the back of the sanctuary and pass through the back door. Sandy is back there and will give you instructions. There are three stations back there. Jerry and Jody and myself will all be back there to wash your feet. There are two chairs at each station. One where you can sit and get your shoes off and your socks off and get ready, and the other for us to be actively washing someone's feet. And so just feel free to come in to sit to the next available chair, and we will be with you shortly. Again, let tonight be a reminder of the selfless act of service that Jesus has offered for each of us that act of service that we would only fully recognize tomorrow on the cross of Golgotha. But for tonight, let us rejoice in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the strength that it gives us to be reconciled with those whom we are called to serve and love. Jerry and Jody, I'm going to invite you to come forward to receive communion, and the ushers will dismiss the rest of us. Let us stand and sing the parting hymn. One bread, one body. 620 if you use the hymn book.
It is my hope that you hear them with fresh ears tonight. Go in peace. Love and serve the Lord. Go in peace to love and serve your neighbor.